Thank you for uh, being with us on this wonderful Saturday night. So we are beginning the uh, LGS Saturday night lectures on specialty surgery and uh, surgical technologies. We have our first international speaker uh, for the program today, Professor Tetsuro Sakai from the University of Pittsburgh. We welcome you, sir. We are very happy to have you here uh, in our program. Thank um, you very much, Dr. Yeah. So um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Professor Sakai uh, to this audience. He is a professor of anesthesiology and perioperative medicine at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center in uh, Pittsburgh, USA. And he is also the professor of Clinical and Translational Science Institute. Uh, what is very interesting for us is that just like the LGS platform, he runs a mentorship program for the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, we would also ask a few questions on that, sir, as the uh, program goes. Uh, he also is the vice chair for professional development. He's the chair of the academic promotions committee. And he also is a faculty member at the McGowan Institute of Regenerative Medicine. His uh, CV is really impressive. Dr. S uh, Ted Sakai is a cardiovascular surgeon with training. He completed his uh, MD in 1989 at uh, Kyoto University. Uh, he did his cardiovascular surgery residency at Tenry Hospital in Nara in 1995, followed by clinical and research fellowships at Toronto from 1996 to 1999. And then he has also done his PhD in cardiovascular surgery at Kyoto University in 2001. And uh, this was followed by uh, anesthesiology residency in uh, UPMC in 2005. He was uh, appointed as the associate professor in 2010 and currently serves as professor of anesthesiology and perioperative medicine since 2014. He's an extremely calming presence at the head end of the table. We have loved having him at the head end of the table during our difficult high melt surgeries uh, during my training time. Um, uh, Dr. Sakai also serves as the president-elect of the Society uh, for the Advancement of Transplant Anesthesia. And he has written a beautiful book on anesthesia and perioperative care in, uh, for organ transplantation along with Dr. Kadir Vil Subramaniam. Dr. Kadir, uh, incidentally, is from our state and uh, he has got lots of links with any of our many of our friends here. Wow. Um, and he's an accomplished uh, author. It's about 100 publications under his name. Uh, the three key ones are about uh, cardiac arrest uh, during adult liver transplantation, the insertion and management of percutaneous venovenous bypass candle for liver transplantation. This is his reference paper, and also pulmonary thromboembolism during adult liver, living, uh, liver transplantation. So um, there are many more things. It's always a pleasure to work with him. And we welcome you, sir, and the platform is yours. We just continue my sharing. Stop sharing. Okay, it's yours, sir. Thank you very much. Such a wonderful and a thorough, uh, you know, introduction. I really appreciate the uh, Dr. Ilango Sethu, who is my friend uh, from his stay in the uh, Pittsburgh, and also I really appreciate the invitation uh, by the Dr. Pata Radha Krishna of this wonderful uh, platform. So without further ado, um, this is the Pittsburgh, and then it's a kind of you know, Photoshop, I'm sure you can uh, notice, but it's one of the beautiful scenery in the city of the United States can offer. So it's selected as one of the best uh, view, city view in the United States. I'm pleasure to working in this UPMC institution since 1999. So this is the kind of almost 20 years of the stay. And then the topic today is, as Dr. Seattle's, uh, you know, introduction, I'm really interested in intraoperative cardiac arrest during liver transplantation, especially the uh, pulmonary thromboembolism. And then I'm not sure whether you have experienced that in your uh, clinical practice, but you may uh, encounter this situation in your, uh, you know, career. So uh, this is uh, Ilango, uh, you know, in, during his, uh, uh, you know, training in the, under the Dr. Stotzel. So during that day, uh, we kind of, you know, uh, share an, a number of nights uh, in the OR room. So this has got a great memory to me. 
as Dr. Sesu mentioned that uh, disclosure wise, Springer Publishing Company, uh, the book loyalty I received, and also I'm a president elect of the SADA. This is the North American based uh, cardiothoracic liver transplant anesthesia gathering. And then we are kind of, you know, increasing in the number, small society, but increasing in number and then up to 150 members. So today's learning objective at the end of the lecture that learners uh, hopefully uh, will be able to understand, I'm sorry, detail of the instance, a clinical presentation and outcome of uh, pulmonary thromboembolism during the liver transplantation and discuss the value of the transesophageal echocardiography during the liver transplantation, as well as a TEG, a thromboelastography, or in some situation, you might use the rotational thromboelastometry, and then for a PTE diagnosis and a potential prediction. And then the most important part is this, plan to implement a multidisciplinary TPA, tissue plasminogen activator protocol, in their institution. Highly recommend uh, uh, this. So let me dive in. Cardiac arrest, uh, you don't want to see in your practice, especially as a surgeon, uh, and then not to mention the anesthesiologist. And then we had an opportunity to review the uh, case of 5,000, over 5,000 cases uh, submitted from seven academic uh, liver transplantation center to see what's the incidence of the cardiac arrest during the liver transplantation. If possible, uh, what is the outcome? And also what would be the uh, clinical characteristics of those people who suffer intraoperative cardiac arrest? And then what we found was that among those over 5,000 5, cases, 3.7% uh, you know, intracardiac uh, arrest uh, occurred and then with the mortality of 1.2%. And then if uh, you encounter intraoperative uh, cardiac arrest, uh, one third of the patient uh, died in the OR room. So uh, using the multivariable generalized linear mixed model, uh, we tried to decipher what would be the odds ratio of the clinical characteristics. What we found was that uh, lower body mass index or higher body mass index carry the risk for the intraoperative cardiac arrest. And also high MELDA score over 30 uh, carry the uh, you know, higher odds of the cardiac arrest. And also uh, if you encounter a post reperfusion syndrome, which uh, defined that after the reperfusion and then a 30% of the reduction from the baseline mean arterial pressure, for five minutes, uh, for one minute, within five minutes, that is the kind of uh, definition, classical definition of the post refusion syndrome. If you encounter those situation, the cardiac arrest, uh, uh, you know, rate is increased. And then uh, for us, it's uh, surprising to find the uh, live donor uh, carry the uh, higher odds ratio which is quite, quite totally surprising to me personally. And then I do not have a good uh, explanation about this. And then reoperation, which uh, defined as the redo liver transplantation carry risk. So what are the causes of the intraoperative cardiac arrest? But before getting into that uh, differential diagnosis for the intracardiac arrest, uh, let me just go back to uh, you know, 10 years ago with you, uh, the uh, striking case I personally encounter uh, as the attending anesthesiologist. So this is a 33-year-old woman with a fulminant hepatic failure, and then she suffered gallstone pancreatitis with the hereditary telangiectasia. He pre she presented to the anesthesiology team in a comatose and coagulopathic. Uh, she got intubated, ventilated, she suffered acute renal failure as she is under the renal replacement therapy. And also uh, she had a history of uh, you know, vancomycin resistant enterococcus bacteremia, which was treated, but that's a more, uh, recent history. Now, she come here to the uh, you know, OR room as a status one, and then uh, undergoing the uh, orthotopic liver transplantation using the cadaveric liver. 
So baseline TEG is uh, like this. It's quite normal. Um, I understand that uh, some of the audience may not necessarily be familiar to the uh, thromboelastography. So I will take some moment to explain about that. Uh, bear with me. So TEG is one of the uh, couple of viscoelastic uh, point of care coagulation uh, monitoring. And then this is the 5000 TEG, which is the kind of traditional device. And then recently, uh, you know, company made the uh, new uh, generation, TEG 6S, available for us. But anyway, so basic uh, concept is such that the graphical display provides you uh, which factor uh, is lacking uh, for the, uh, in the case of the uh, low coagulability. So we have the reaction time when you start the uh, you know, experiment in vitro and then starting the thrombin burst. So how long does it take? And that's constitute the reaction time here. And then K time indicated that uh, from the onset of our time uh, end, uh, to the uh, one uh, 10 millimeter, uh, you know, uh, width of the uh, graph uh, separate. So this is the, uh, you know, how long does it take uh, to achieve the initial uh, milestone of the coagulation? That's represented with a K. Alpha angle is how quickly the thrombin burst occurred and also fibrin uh, formation uh, occurred. Then maximum amplitude is indication of how strong those fibrin, uh, you know, strand forms. And then I would like to uh, take the uh, attention to the lysis 30, which indicated that uh, what's the kind of you know, percentage lysis in 30 minutes after the maximum amplitude is taking place. So that's indicated that uh, whether the patient has the normal lysis pattern or hyperfibrinol lysis. So in the uh, liver transplantation OR site uh, we have in the UPMC, we, have, we are fortunate to have the eight uh, TEG machine, which has the designated room uh, controlled by the OR technician. And then that can display a multiple uh, follow-up TEG pattern like this. So let me show you the uh, one of the representative TEG pattern uh, during the uh, liver transplantation. So this is the baseline, as you can see that it's fat and then good. So reaction time, 8.7 minutes. Uh, the you know, bottom part is the range of the normal uh, comparison. So four to nine minutes is considered to be normal, therefore, the reaction time of this case is normal. K time is 2.1, normal range is one to three minutes, so it's normal. And then alpha angle 61.7 uh, degree, uh, so range is 59 to 74, so this is normal angle. And a maximum amplitude is 47.6 millimeter, which is relatively lower than the lower threshold, uh, which is 55. And then lysis patterns 3.9%. Normal lysis range is 0.28%. Uh, Therefore, uh, this is considered to be the physiological lysis pattern. So all in all, uh, only the maximum amplitude is lower, uh, but uh, pretty much the baseline coagulation pattern itself looks good. So this is, uh, you know, 60 minutes after the incision. Uh, one indicated that stage of the liver transplantation. As you know, there are three stages. So first stage is pre and hepatic stage. So 60 minutes, and then we repeat that. And then a maximum amplitude is relatively small, but pretty much the same with the baseline pattern. So stage two uh, after the uh, unhepatic phase, and then so this is the 10 minutes into the uh, uh, stage two, and then you notice that there's no significant change of the pattern itself. So this is a stage three, which means that neohepatic phase. So five minutes after the reperfusion of the liver, uh, we did the uh, uh, standard uh, portal vein anosmosis first, and then hepatic artery next. So this is immediately after the portal 
uh, vein is connected and also the IVC is uh, you know, connected uh, to the hepatic vein calf. So this is the reperfusion in our institution. So this is the five minutes after the uh, reperfusion pattern. As you notice that it's kind of, you know, uh, some, our time is normal, but angle is small, maximum amplitude is small, and a massive pattern of the lysis. So lysis 30 is 91.9%. So which indicate that a massive, uh, you know, endogenous tissue plus minogen actuator discharge so, you know, we sometimes use the heparinase to see whether the heparin or heparinoid is circulating. Of course, there's no change from the natural pattern. However, when we add uh, the uh, natural with the amicar, which is the ipsilon aminocaproic acid, uh, which is the uh, anti fibrinol lysis medication, and then that will normalize the pattern compared to the uh, you know, natural pattern. So in such a way, we can make the diagnosis, okay, so this is because of the massive lysis, therefore, immediate treatment of this coagulopathy, if you want, is the indication of the uh, antifibrinolytics, uh, you know, amicar, for example. And then 30 minutes after the reperfusion, a natural is a flat, and then a heparinase, and then some kind of, you know, improvement, but not much. And then Amicar kind of fixed the pattern of the lysis, so which indicated that uh, endogenous heparinase, uh, heparin, heparinoid rather, uh, and also the endogenous tissue perhaps seminogen activator is circulating. So liver is supposed to work at this stage, and then you will see the natural improvement. But this particular case, the graft uh, function recovered uh, relatively slowly. Uh, then it'll take 90 minutes after the reperfusion to see this one. And then what's the kind of reason of the prolongation of the R? And then it because of the heparinoid or uh, because when you add the heparinase to the natural and then a significant improvement or reduction of the R type, which means that coagulopathy, you can see in the surgical field, can be fixed with the, uh, you know, antagonist of the heparin, so which is the protein, which we used uh, in the clinical setting here without using the other uh, products. So this is the beauty of the differential diagnosis can be made with the use of this technology. So, uh, you know, rather kind of long side of track, and let me go back to the case. So TEG at five minutes after the perfusion, as you can see that our time is prolonged, the angle is small, and the maximum amplitude is reduced, and then lysis pattern can be uh, you know, found, which is comparison of the amicar. Uh, and then so each in, which indicated that uh, not only the uh, decrease of the uh, coagulation factor maybe, uh, but also there's a kind of increasing activity of the endogenous uh, tissue plasma and minogen activator. Now, so uh, there's a sudden increase of the PA pressure and then a decrease of the systemic blood pressure uh, was noticed in the 15 minutes after the perfusion. So something wrong happened. So uh, 30 minutes, the TEG flat, and then we try to kind of we'll see what's the reason for that. And then, so we discuss about the uh, differential diagnosis, TEE itself is okay. So surgical team finished the hepatic artery osmosis, and then they want me to fix the uh, quadruopathy before uh, they move on to the biliary osmosis. So what I did as the first year, actually in the third month of my attending ship of uh, the anesthesiologist, I naturally grab the applied platelet in the cryo, and then we just infuse those in the central line. And also, in order to treat the uh, sudden increase of the PA pressure, uh, we kind of made the uh, trial for the nitric oxide uh, inhalation to control the uh, pulmonary hypertension. Then clot appeared suddenly in RV and RA. So this was 60 minutes after the perfusion, and then it just happened the cryo and a platelet has been uh, given. 
and then nitric oxide machines just arrived in the OR room. Uh, suddenly, immediately, uh, I gave the 20,000 inter, uh, international unit of heparin in order to prevent the further increase of the clot. And then, but the uh, systemic hypertension ensued and the VFIV arrest. Uh, this happened five minutes after the clot appeared in the TEE. I apologize, I do not have the nice uh, legal. Uh, so this is a still image, but still, hopefully, you can appreciate the uh, sun flurry inside the uh, right side of the heart. So during the CPR, uh, you can see the uh, clot formed for the right atrium uh, along with the right ventricle. And then we gave the uh, TPA, tissue press minogen activator, uh, a couple of mi uh, milligram, and then a clot disappeared, but uh, you know, there's no good activity of uh, the left side. So as you can see, the left side of the uh, left ventricle is ballooning and the hypokinetic in a globary. So we called the uh, CT uh, surgery team to institute the VA ECMO for the last ditch effort. But despite the uh, full heparinization, uh, but immediately when we start the ECMO, uh, you can see that, uh, you know, huge clot formed in the left side of the ventricle. And then we have to, uh, you know, call the uh, case. So this itched me a uh, quite big impression on me. And then I'm immediately attracted about the history of the pulmonary embolism in the UPMC history. So I did the uh, chart review, a three years period, 2004 and 2006, and then adult uh, isolated cadaveric. Uh, then the definition of the period, but the period is pre-operative holding area to admission to the ICU after the liver transplant. So uh, in order to make the clear diagnosis of the pulmonary thromboembolism, uh, we institute the diagnostic criteria uh, from the hemodynamic changes as well as uh, transesophageal echocardiography. I have to mention that uh, in the UPMC, every patient who undergo liver transplantation received the, the in, uh, intraoperative monitoring by the uh, transesophageal echocardiography. Therefore, we have all the patient's data. So, uh, you know, sudden onset of systemic hypertension with elevated right-sided pressure and a TE findings of the clot in the pulmonary artery tree or acute dilatation of the RV and then empty the LB, with or without blood clot in the cardiac chambers. Of note, uh, it's extremely difficult to identify the uh, clot inside the pulmonary artery trees. And then, uh, so it's, it, it's kind of always, almost always, we will find some clot formation in the cardiac chambers. However, uh, there's an instance that uh, there's no clot was, uh, you know, observed under the examination of the TEE, but still uh, those kind of acute right-sided strain pattern itself uh, strongly indicated the existence of the uh, pulmonary thromboembolism. So that's the diagnostic criteria. So what have we found? We have 495 liver transplant case, cases. Uh, live donor liver transplantation cases were excluded. And then uh, age 54, Melda score is not so high, 21. And we have found that 20 cases, uh, which indicated 4%, of the incidence of uh, pulmonary thromboembolism. When those pulmonary embolism occurred, uh, there's no case uh, occurred, uh, you know, uh, dissection phase, which is the stage one, uh, you know, pre-unhepatic phase. And then during the unhepatic phase, we have a minority of the cases, three. We utilize the veno venous bypass, by the way, for all the cases here. And then uh, remaining 17 cases, uh, you know, developed the pulmonary thromboembolism, uh, you know, during the stage three after the neohepatic phase. Especially seven cases, uh, you know, PTE taking place within five minutes after the reperfusion. So operative mortality in 30%, and then a six-day mortality is 45%. 
And then a presentation of the PTE is manifested with the cardiac arrest, uh, you know, three fourths of the cases. So this is the patient and then graft survival respectively. Uh, and then you can notice that significant difference between the uh, known PTE and the PTE group. Of course, PTE group has the worst, worst patient survival and graft survival together. But I would like to take a caution uh, or attention uh, for these. So once the patients survive the cardiac arrest intraoperatively, uh, their longevity itself is not necessarily bad, so which is indicated the uh, similar uh, kind of degression pattern of the non-PTE group. Therefore, we have to save those patients inside the OR room. So clinical characteristics, uh, you know, unfortunately, we only have 20 cases. Therefore, we cannot, we couldn't do the multivariate uh, regression analysis. But we saw that the theme here, if you see systemic arterial hypertension, and then there's a kind of a significant increase of the PTE. And also, interestingly, uh, flat TEG pattern, as you see that in the five minutes, and then more all the time, has carried the higher odds to develop the PTE. So flip side of the coin is that, okay, so we identified the 4% of the case developed PTE. How about what, what is the PTE inside the cardiac rest? So uh, we did the uh, other uh, retrospective research uh, to see that uh, how, what's the incidence of cardiac rest uh, for the uh, over one, uh, 1,200 cases in the deceased donor uh, transplantation in our in our center. And then uh, we found 5% incidence of intraoperative cardiac rest. And then we just kind of uh, examine what's the reason of the cardiac rest. And then pulmonary thromboembolism uh, has the majority of the case. Of course, I have to acknowledge that uh, there's an unknown case only represented with the uh, positive perfume syndrome is uh, 26 uh, cases. And then other reason could be hyperkalemia or uncontrollable bleeding or pulmonary edema. So uh, cardiac arrest uh, often uh, associated with the PTE. And then so uh, what's the reason of the PTE? A TEG is almost flat, so which indicated that uh, there's no kind of you know, possibility to create the clot you know, theoretically, but that's not the case. Uh, the concept of a sudden burst of the thrombin formation, of fibrillin formation inside the heart, as well as pulmonary vasculature, is presented by Dr. Yu Gu Kim, who is the inaugural uh, liver transplant anesthesiology chief at UPMC, uh, who worked uh, with the uh, Dr. Stas's team. In uh, 2009, he presented this uh, so. Even though there's a lot of coagulation issues going on, unless you have the um, uh, inflammatory response inside the Asian or tissue injury, uh, there's no uh, reaction taking place. So, which means that only one dynamite required to cause the major intracardiac and then pulmonary thrombus. So, you know, my experience as an anesthesiologist, and then unfortunately, uh, a company well, had the, a couple of uh, pulmonary thromboembolism and then a cardiac arrest uh, during my uh, career as the hepatic liver, tra liver transplant anesthesiologist, uh, totally kind of fit to this concept itself. Anyway, so what is the treatment? Uh, when you see that your patient, uh, you know, got the cardiac arrest, and then your TE shows the PTE. Uh, you got to do the aggressive treatment uh, for hemodynamic instability. Um, then do not continue the uh, stasis of the blood flow, which will uh, you know, exaggerate the uh, clot formation. So uh, prophylactic catecholamine treatment prior to the reperfusion is mandatory, and then aggressive CPR is required. And then uh, this is a recurrent phenomena. So one, one time, once a PTE can uh, occur in your case, 
uh, even though the patient survived the initial incidence, uh, there's a potential or higher potential uh, the PTE can take place uh, you know, later in the case. So uh, we have to be extremely vigilant. So too much clot burden leads to cardiac arrest. In that case, you have to solve the uh, what you know uh, you know solve the clot burden, and then let the heart uh, you know function you know smoothly. So what you can do? Uh, there's a very nice uh, case series reported in 2011 from Northwestern. Uh, Dr. Andre De Wolf, who is a senior uh, author as the senior anesthesiologist uh, relocated from UPMC to Northwestern. But anyway, so they uh, used the low-dose TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, 0.5 to 4 milligram, uh, when they encounter the intraoperative uh, pulmonary thromboembolism in liver transplantation cases. And then they save all four cases uh, successfully. So, uh, as you might know, uh, TPA is a very low dosage here. Uh, in the emergency situation of the uh, you know, acute coronary event or uh, stroke in the brain, they often use the 50, uh, 50 milligram or 100 milligram. Therefore, this is the very small dosage. So based on that experience, uh, we discussed among the anesthesiology and then surgery and then pharmacy department uh, in the UPMC. And then we created the UPMC liver transplantation intraoperative tissue plasminogen activator policy. And then what it is, is that uh, preparedness of the TPA inside the OR room. Each case, uh, we prepare uh, two vials of the TPA, uh, two milligram vial in the OR room for each liver transplantation cases. As you know, uh, these uh, TPA has to be uh, kept in, uh, uh, you know, uh, refrigerated. And therefore, if uh, you do not use the TPA vials, and then the next day we have to turf that uh, unused vial to the cath lab where they use the, you know, uh, many TPA, uh, uh, you know, uh, the vials in such a way, uh, reduce the waste of this expensive medication. So this preparedness, and then save the one case after the implementation of the, this, uh, you know, policy for one year. So among the 99 cases after that policy implemented, we encountered the one case. So 45-year-old female with a hip C, and the male score is high, 40, and then a de deceased donor liver transplantation, developed PTE uh, post perfusion. As you might notice, that TE shows the clear clot formation of the right atrium. And then, uh, the anesthesiologist immediately administered TPA, 2 milligram IV in one minute. And then TPA uh, actually resolved the, all the clot. And then a heart, uh, you know, hemodynamics is normalized. Of course, uh, TEG is flat line, but within the 90 minutes, and then liver graft is started working. And then uh, coagulation pattern is uh, quite normalized without blood transfusion. So this is our experience. So uh, during the you know, liver transplantation and then pulmonary thromboembolism can occur. And then so uh, therefore TPA uh, has to be administered uh, in that instance. Uh, there's no discussion or no argument between the anesthesia and the liver transplantation team in the facing of the crisis, therefore, uh, discussion before uh, anything has happened and then make sure we understand the indication and then impact of the TPA. And so we kind of totally agree and then when we see that T, uh, you know, pulmonary thromboembolism uh, during the case and then we immediately agree to provide the low-dose TPA. So in such a way, anesthesiology team, surgery, and a pharmacy team can make the difference. So this is the kind of uh, uh, you know example uh, we kind of know established in the UPMC currently. Well, thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Dr. Sakai. That was wonderful. Um, the floor is open for discussion. I will take the privilege of asking the uh, first few questions. Uh, from the surgeon's point of view, Yes. Uh, Ilanga, you're muted yourself. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'll go ahead with the first question. We have some anesthesiologists and transplant surgeons in the forum, and you okay. uh, can take the discussion from there. Um, what would be the ideal and hepatic phase preparation that a surgeon should know and an anesthesia trainee? in liver transplant should know? What are the hemodynamic parameters that should, they should know of? Uh, the hematologic parameters. So it's got to be, you know, assuming that's a kind of preparation for the reperfusion, is it okay? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. So as you mentioned, uh, as I mentioned that, you know, five minutes, within the five minutes after the reperfusion, you will see the uh, number of hemodynamic derangement. Uh, so in the, uh, we kind of try to enhance the uh, cardiac activity before the reperfusion. And then uh, for, uh, number one is that starting low dose catechromines. And then if the heart rate is lower, in that case, we would choose the uh, uh, epinephrine and then a 0.05 uh, starting mics per kilo per minute. And then starting that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, before the reperfusion, probably in a five minutes. Uh, before the, uh, you know, actually the perfusion. So, of course, timing is important. So, we have to communicate with the anesthesia team and then the surgical team. And also, uh, we use the forced alkalization of the uh, pH. Uh, therefore, we provide the uh, 50 uh, mech equivalent of the bicarbonate, uh, you know, before the perfusion. And also, uh, you know, almost the 30 seconds before the reperfusion, uh, we give the uh, low dosage of methylene blue, which is the kind of you know, uh, nitric oxide uh, suppressor. And then, so in such a way, uh, we will see the uh, kind of a decrease of the production of nitric oxide. We usually use the 50 milligram of methylene blue to 100 milligram of methylene blue in a relatively you know, quicker pattern. And then of course, your sat saturation monitor is decreased because of the blue dye circulating, but you will see the uh, significant increase of the blood pressure. And also uh, given that uh, you, you know, a large amount of calcium uh, concentration is also important. And then so in order to uh, prevent the potential uh, immediate future hypocalcemia, we provide the uh, uh, calcium chloride, one gram, uh, immediately before the reperfusion. Make sure at the time of the reperfusion, all the medication is circulating around. And then we uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, watch the patient. And then once the reperfusion taking place, assuming there's no large bleeding, and then we watch the TEE uh, carefully, and the cardiac function, and also heart rate of blood pressure. If the blood pressure is kind of, you know, coming down, and then you have to treat the trend, not the definitive number. So for example, if the systolic blood pressure is starting at 140, and then there's kind of slowly decline 120, 100, relatively quick. If that's the case, you have to administer additional medication, including epi, novo epi, or if those are not work, additional calcium, and also vasopressin. Vasopressin is quite effective medication, and but uh, uh, underutilized uh, because it does not kind of you know, require the uh, you know uh, alpha and beta uh, catechromine channel. So uh, those are the kind of armamentarium we have as the anesthesiologist. Make sure the heart rate is continued. Make sure the blood pressure is kind of you know, uh, you know more than more than well, kind of go back to the normal level. So, okay, uh, okay this is kind you. of anecdotal. And then when we discuss about the treatment, and then in the United States, each institution has the different formula. So uh, pl please consider, uh, even among the North America, there's a big discussion about whether we have to use the Michelin Blue as we do in the UPMC or not whether you have to do the forced alkalization as we do in the UPMC. 
but uh, I think this is the prophylactic uh, approach and then a catechramming volume and also calcium and then mentioning blue plus minus and then a preparation of those kind of urgent administration of the next line of the medication is important. Thank you, Dr. Sakai. I, um, I, the floor is uh, to the audience. Um, there's a um, question in the chat hello. box. Yeah, Dr. Akkod has asked, do you think that severe steatotic grafts have high incidence of TE? Uh, and if so, any idea why? Uh, sorry, once again, could you repeat uh, the question? Do, do you think that severe steatotic grafts... Oh, steatotic uh, graft. Uh -huh. Well, high mm -hmm. it's kind of considerable. And then you're right. And then if we have a chance to do the research, that may. But uh, among the uh, most recent uh, analysis we did, and then unfortunately, we do not have the quality of the graft in the uh, EDO analysis. We only kind of you know, differentiate the graft uh, in the two categories. One is the deceased donor or live donor. So we do not have the uh, kind of most, uh, more granular uh, analysis inside the uh, you know, deceased donor. So, uh, but it's quite plausible. So maybe this is the kind of future, uh, you know, consideration about the graft quality itself. Uh, Dr. Mishra's question is that, uh, how do you deal with cardiac arrest not related to pulmonary embolism? Hmm. So, uh, assuming that uh, there is no kind of you know, a pattern, I described that the TE looks kind of you know, relatively normal, which means that there is no increase of the right side of the heart and no decrease of the left ventricle, and then there is no visible uh, thrombus formation. In that case, you have to achieve the same way, same pattern, and then without the TPA administration. Okay. However, though, uh, those kind of the stasis of the blood under the cardiac arrest may cause the, uh, uh, you know, in, inside to formation of the thrombus, second rally. Okay. So therefore, uh, once you see that cardiac arrest, whatever the reason, and then you have to aware uh, those situations may kind of cause the intracardiac uh, thrombus formation or uh, pulmonary thromboembolism, you know, as a secondary effect of the stasis of the blood. So that's the reason during the uh, CPR, uh, you have to monitor TEE constantly. And then if any sign of the uh, clot formation, uh, that's the kind of indication uh, for the low dose TPA. Um, Dr. Sakai, do you feel that routine uh, use of PA catheter use um, is, uh, is a risk factor for intracardiac thrombosis during liver transplantation? Uh, there is the opinion about that, and, but there is no definitive uh, you know, research going on. So when you go back to the uh, Dr. Warner, uh, Groningen Group's uh, you know, retrospective research, they kind of uh, postulated that usage of the catheter, especially in a PA catheter, uh, can be the nidus of the thrombus formation. But uh, there's no definitive answer there. Um, Dr. Selva, Ashwin, Mahesh, any questions from your side? Uh, um, I have a couple of questions, uh, Dr. Saiki. Um, one is, you know, you, you thank you for, you know, clearly describing about the TEG, TEG. Mm -hmm. And you showed in your case scenarios, it was initially flat, like immediately after reperfusion, and mm -hmm. it was a flat. And then only these events happen. So right. can we predict this um, pulmonary thromboembolism or a clot in the right atrium or right ventricle prior to development by use of TEG? Mm -hmm. That's one question. Yeah, yeah go yeah. on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me just kind of respond. It could be long. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, personally, I believe that uh, TEG can detect the uh, blood uh, or circulation, and then which kind of you know, prone to create the uh, thrombus formation. But there's no kind of definitive uh, time line 
So uh, the argument when I published the paper in the VJA, and then they kind of you know request me to change this is the kind of you know, diagnostic, but into the association <laughs> with the PTE. So uh, since we we are not uh, kind of you know, constantly monitoring the TEG, there's some time delay, and then we don't know when the uh, uh, onset of the PTE. Mm -hmm. So I cannot say in a definitive answer whether the TEG flatline is definitively uh, only the associating a factor or prediction uh, factor. Sure. Um, my next question is uh, following Dr. Mohammed Akul's question, you know, regarding the grafts and also the recipient factors. So some of the disease process like a PSC and they are more thrombotic and again, on the graft factor, uh, like a steatotic graft or a DCD livers um, mm -hmm. can be more prone for this, you know, uh, PTE and the thrombus formation in the right mm -hmm. Because uh, when I was in Cleveland, we had an uh, incident with the DCD graft. I think not only one incident, a couple of incidents with the DCD graft. Um, we revived two patients, but one patient we couldn't revive. So mm -hmm. sometimes we are a bit more anxious with the DCD grafts, especially if the DCD is like kind of, even the DCD is kind of marginal, not like a young donor, it's a big, mm -hmm. you know, bit older donor and a little bit of, you know, uh, fatty liver. So mm -hmm. those cases, we prepare everything, you know, um, to, you know, anticipate this. And sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't happen. So we can treat them accordingly. Do you, you know, study, do you have anything specific regarding the recipient factor or the graph factor that mm -hmm. actually, you know, makes you think this patient will most probably will develop PTE mm -hmm. and thrombus in the right side of the heart? Okay. So let me start with the donor factor. I completely agree with you. Uh, extended cardiac donor, especially in a DCD, uh, is kind of carry the risk along with the, uh, you know, steatotic liver graft. And then, so especially, uh, you know, hemodynamic derangement after the perfusion is significant. And then acidosis is significant. That's totally kind of depend on the graft function after the reperfusion in general. And then does not reach the stage of the PTE formation or cardiac arrest. But we, as the anesthesiologists, often uh, experience about uh, those kind of, you know, delayed graft function uh, you know, actually the worsening the uh, pH and then worsening the hemodynamics and then increasing lactate and then uh, worsening the coagulopathy, which may or may not end up with the intracardiac arrest. So certainly the hemodynamic derangement is totally dependent on the quality of the graft. Now, recipient. You mentioned about the P PSC and then uh, you know, biliary cirrhosis or even the uh, HCC. Uh, so those kind of cancer patient has the preferential increase of the MELDA score. So they come here in a MELDA score 22, but you know, graft, uh, liver function itself is okay. And then oftentimes those cancer patient, as well as uh, biliary sclerosis patient, has the completely normal TEG pattern, or even a higher hypercoagulability. So can those patients who has the pre-existing hypercoagulability detected by the TEG lead to the higher incidence of the PTE or cardiac arrest? No, I do not think so, which does not demonstrate it by our retrospective research. Rather, those patients who has the hypercoagulable pattern can lead to the post-operative hepatic uh, artery thrombosis, acute and chronic, later. So that's the kind of relationship is, uh, you know, almost established, uh, but not the intraoperative cardiac arrest or PTE uh, thrombus formation. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Dr. Silva? Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sakai, for that um, excellent talk. I just have thank a practical... Uh, uh, Please introduce yourself. Uh, Hello. 
Can you yeah, nice yeah. to see the uh, surgeon or anesthesiologist. So, <laughs> okay, sure. I'm an anesthesiologist working in oh, Chennai wonderful. in global hospitals. So, so I just have a practical query here. Like, you have a big series of patients who had uh, perioperative cardiac arrest. You know, uh, I was wondering uh, how exactly the the resuscitation happens there. Uh, uh, do we have uh, effective CPRs delivered by transthoracic route? How do we, you know, quickly remove the uh, retractors, or do you resort to direct open cardiac, uh, you know, uh, pumps there? That was my first question. So. Yeah. So uh, yes, and then outside, inside. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, outside, inside. So you know, outside, and then surgical team will do the uh, usual CPR, of course, and then we do whatever we have to do, and then oftentimes if it doesn't work, in the case we request the surgical team to you know doing the direct cardiac massage. Uh, from the uh, you know diaphragmectomy, so they cut the diaphragm and the inside the heart, and then a left side of course, and then just kind of crash the heart, well kind of squeeze the heart from the inside. Uh, probably that's the best uh, you know intraoperative cardiac massage. The surgical team can help us, and then if it works great. If it doesn't work, and then what's the kind of second uh, you know stage? So medical intervention uh, does not work. In that case, uh, we have to utilize the uh, surgical uh, extracorporeal circulation support. So we have uh, uh, you know, at least the wonderful experience of the utilization of the ECMO, especially in a VA ECMO uh, for the heart and then lung support, but uh, none of the patients survived. Uh, but uh, other institutions implement the ECMO team, and then in placing the ECMO for those post cardiac arrest uh, liver transplant recipient, and then they successfully save the patient, uh, you know, after the surgery. So recently, I think uh, one of the recent paper in the anesthesiology group in Mount Sinai uh, reported the two cases, and then. As far as I know, we have probably 15 or more uh, cases uh, treated by the ECMO after the intraoperative cardiac arrest of liver transplantation cases. Sure, sure. Okay, so just uh, another practical question here. So how long does it take for you to establish the ECMO in your you know, center? Yeah. Good question, good question. Uh, it takes a long time because uh, we have two OR rooms. One is the cardiac team, uh, and then the other one is the liver team. And then Dr. Sethu probably know, you know quite well. And then between those two hospitals, and then uh, it'll take probably enough 15 minutes to yeah. kind of go. And then we have to call the uh, uh, perfusion team or surgeon especially uh, from the other site. So, uh, we have to make the uh, kind of, you know, a little bit more proactive approach. If the patient yeah. is kind of dwindling down, and then we kind of try start calling the CT surgeon. Hey, we have a case. We may need your help from the VA ECMO. And then, so in that regard, uh, at the time we definitely need the ECMO. Uh, they are ready. So, other institution which has the opportunity to have the side-by-side -side liver transplantation and cardiac transplant. In that case, there's no kind of, you know, uh, yeah. of those. But unfortunately, you do not have those logistics. Yeah. Okay, okay. So this ECMO patients, uh, none of them had any, uh, say, for example, loss of um, uh, CNS functions or any anoxic injuries or anything like that. Do we end up in patients where we resuscitated the patients but still end up with a... Oxic injury or something like that? Yeah, uh, certainly. Uh, so thrombus, uh, stroke, and then bleeding, intracranial bleeding. So those are the kind of potential uh, complication, as everybody know. But uh, in the in the OR room uh, during the liver transplant, uh, we could not go there. So yeah. there is no definite way to evaluate the brain uh, function. So our job is to make sure the patient survives in the OR room. Uh, in the you know ECMO and then go to the ICU and then after that uh, you know heart is saved and lung is okay and then they evaluate the brain. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, okay, thank you. So just another last question. Uh, so what would we think would be the perioperative vari variables which can uh, you know, uh, precipitate uh, uh, a pulmonary embolism? Is, it, um, uh, is there anything like a cross clamp of IVC or, uh, or antifibrinolytics or um, the duration of anapatic phase or any specific numbers do you think will be relevant? Uh, it's a great question. We try to, you know, identify why uh, this happened, where the clot come, and then uh, some of the uh, uh, kind of, you know, standard notion that uh, those clot come from, you know, lower body, including yeah. the IVC, or could it be come from the graft uh, to the heart? And then I oppose that notion because does not kind of uh, suit to my intraoperative observation of those uh, thrombus formation, especially in intracardiac thrombus formation. So, you know, I would rather uh, stand on the opinion that those kind of clot formation is de novo clot formation inside the heart, as well as pulmonary vasculature, instead of thrombus, coming from the, you know, leg, IVC, or graft. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But okay. again, again, this is kind of a hypothesis and a personal observation, my opinion. And then so... Sure, sure. But uh, you must know that all the endothelial, uh, you know, lining of the lung and also heart, and then, uh, you know, for those recipients undergoing liver transplantation is totally deranged, especially in uh, lining the glycocalyx itself is, uh, you know, severely uh, damaged. And then with those, uh, you know, incidents, as well as, uh, you know, micro, uh, you know, free factor A and a free factor two formation, without normal endothelial cell to catch those free uh, activated uh, coagulation factors and then, uh, you know, normally kind of degrade uh, those factors. They may be in a free floating of the factor 2, uh, factor yeah. 2A and factor 10A. Those could be the nidus of yes. the intracardiac clot formation. So. Okay, sure. On oh, um, you know associated question here, uh, do you use uh, uh, plasmas or uh, something like uh, prothrombin concentrates as a routine uh, correction? Oh. Do you think anything uh, this has anything to do with the you know, clottings? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, because of the cost issue uh, in the United States, North America, uh, those uh, you know. Uh, PCC and also the uh, concentrated factor usage is uh, not common. So we have to rely on the report from the European group uh, where they use the you know, four-factor PCC and then a three-factor PCCs. And then, uh, especially in the German group, uh, you know, stressed the benefit of the usage yeah. of PCC uh, because of the, uh, the volume uh, reduction. So yeah. uh, you can uh, decrease the uh, you know, volume of burden uh, of the recipient and then surgeon. You know, if you give too much volume, you know, mm. there's a kind of hole and then uh, there's more blood coming from. So yeah. True. we have an obligation to reduce the volume in such a way hydrostatic uh, you know, bleeding can be prevented in a surgical field. Right. But I do not have, we do not have a good data in the United sure. States, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay, sure. There is one more question from the chat box. Mm -hmm. Have you found any, this is again from Dr. Akkad, have you found a, a correlation with uh, prolonged cold ischemia time and, and a cardiac arrest? Mm. Uh, we don't know, we don't know. Uh, again, uh, you know, prolongation of the cold ischemia time is one of the factor of the definition of the extended criteria donor graft and then, as I said, we only have the alive versus deceased donor analysis, and then uh, we do not have such granularity. But again, uh, the impact of the extended graft, extended criteria graft on the uh, reperfusion, and then hypotension, acidosis, coagulopathy is, uh, you know, already known. So uh, I do not be so surprised to see that the cardiac arrest may be increased with the usage of those uh, cases. 
Perfect. Uh, Ilango, there's Thank one you. question uh, yeah. from uh, audience, Professor Sakai. Uh, do you have any experience with non-PRS, pre-reperfusion cardiac arrest related to hypotension? In your data presented, you had five cases where the cause was not clear. Did any of them had hypotension preceding cardiac arrest? Okay, so um, then initial part, I kind of missed the uh, question again. Uh, okay. So, yeah, could non reperfusion you... cardiac arrest related oh, to... non-reperfusion. Okay, so uh, non-reperfusion cardiac arrest. I see. Okay, so there's a 26 incidence of the you know post reperfusion syndrome, and then versus so, several cases with the cardiac arrest without uh, reperfusion syndrome, right? Right. Okay. So, what's the are the reason of the those patients who suffer cardiac arrest without having the uh, post reperfusion syndrome? That's the kind of question. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, we don't know. So that's the reason we just kind of place the unknown with or without uh, post reperfusion syndrome. So there's no kind of issue of the thrombus. There's no issue of the hyperkaremia. There's no issue of the pulmonary uh, you know, edema. And then there's no issue about the other you know, decipherable reason. So again, still, uh, those kind of cases can happen. Thank you, Dr. Sakai. Uh, it was a wonderful lecture. Thank you for being with us. Um, it's a pleasure. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you very if much there, again. For everybody. There's one other guest. Ratan, uh, you have a question. Ratan, you have uh, raised your hand. Yeah, happy to answer anything. Yeah, Ratan, go ahead. Ratan, you, should, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. And Ashwin, do you have any questions? Either? Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can Hello? hear you. Yeah, this is Dr. Ratan from Rail Institute, uh, Chennai. Anastasia is from uh, Chennai, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, it's a good presentation, thank you. But very, very scary as an anesthetist being part of a uh, cardiac arrest <laughs> during yeah. the OR. Uh, it's a 4% is really a, a big number. And uh, and what, what my question is, uh, is it uh, because of the cardiac arrest has happened after uh, seeing the uh, flatline tech uh, mm -hmm. due to correction due to plasma or uh, cryoprecipitate or platelets. After mm -hmm. that, you had a clot formation or mm -hmm. is it the other way around? I mean, you had a uh, tag found to have a clot and then you, you've given something else. I mean, that's because you had 20, case, 20 patients in that 500, pa mm -hmm. 500 patients out of which isn't it? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you very much. Uh, Rothan. So um, what I did a uh, wrong approach, you know, I have to criticize myself, my management, because uh, when you see the TEG is flat and then a surgical team is kind of, you know, kind of ask you to correct the, uh, you know, bleeding, you know, do it, do it, do it. So I never thought about ongoing a hyperfibrinolysis, okay? And then without fixing the hyperfibrinolysis, I gave the correlation of factors. Cryo, five units, and then five units platelet, as quick as possible. So, which means that uh, there's kind of some, you know, abnormal things going on, all right? So then we just kind of put more, uh, you know, dynamite inside. Yeah. Yeah, so there's kind of flame going on. I'm sorry, this is kind of just the visual, you know, you know, imagination. So something that is going on, and then you give more timber, more paper to grow, and then more dynamite, and then so it's natural uh, that patient is going to develop the intra, you know, cardiac uh, intraoperative, uh, you know, pulmonary embolism. So what I should have done was that just kind of uh, put the flame first. From yeah. How? Well, anti femoralytics You know, I should have given the, uh, you know, up, you know, up caploic acid, amicar. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you don't need that too much dosage, and then maybe kind of candy-ish is okay. And then after you give that, wait for the uh, kind of hyperfibrinolytic pathway is suppressed. Then, then you can use. 
then you kind of start giving the cry or platelet, whatever you prefer, in a very slow and then you know, careful manner. So that's the kind of thing I should have done that personally. So I would like to just go back to the uh, 50 years ago when I kind of treat the case. And then I changed my practice that way. When you see the front line, the surgical teams complain about the bleeding, and I almost always give the antifibrinolytics first. Trust then, yeah. yeah, and then slowly uh, giving the cryonuclated. So as you go team want to kind of push you, hey. No, that's what, um, yeah, that's I what I'm. Yeah, I have to go, go ahead. You know, I have to go ahead for the bioduct. Yeah, you know, what's yeah. going on? Well, you know, I just got to you know, talk to the surgeon. Hey, you know, you guys. Hang on. Just enjoy, relax. <laughs> yeah, go to the restroom. Yes. You know, go eat, drink somewhere. And yes, then yes. in the meantime, give me 30 minutes. Yes, yeah, yes. I'll fix that for you in a safer manner. So that's kind of a discussion uh, we kind of make almost always. So yes. I'm so fortunate to have such kind of human relationship with the surgical team. The surgical team really appreciate our input and then we communicate almost always. So uh, that's communication is so critical. And then so we, we are so happy in the UPMC and then we have such kind of camaraderie. But thank you very much. That's a very thank important you. practical point. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? Last question. Sure. Sorry, to, um, uh, very good presentation. Just one. Uh, is it anything related to the cardiac condition of the patient, like uh, high IPA pressures or POPH in, in the pre-op in these 20 patients? Anything related to cardiopulmonary uh, problems in these patients? Any of no. these patients? No. Yeah. Oh, no. Thank no. you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. Any more questions for the audience? Yeah, I think we've we've had a one hour of discussion. Thank you, Dr. Sakai. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's thank a, you it's so a, much. Uh, you know, I really appreciate it. And then it's a kind of enjoyable to discuss with such a kind of enthusiastic, you know, you know, audience. audience and yeah. Then, yeah, I I know you are tired. You know, oh, today you got a precious good, day. Good. Yeah, you have to take the time with the uh, precious time with your family member, and then I'm going to from now on. <laughs> but you guys have Thank to you. sleep. Yeah, but so nice. And then I uh, really appreciate uh, Dr. Irango Setu and also the uh, Dr. Pata Radha Krishna. So really appreciate it for the invitation. I'm um, you know immensely enjoyed the discussion. So. Thank you, sir. Pleasure having you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good Thank night. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. All right. Good night. Okay. Bye-bye.